are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. This year's Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded to Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov for their courageous fight for freedom of expression in the Philippines and Russia. While announcing the award, the Norwegian Nobel Committee highlighted the efforts of these two extraordinary journalists to safeguard freedom of expression, which is a precondition for democracy and lasting peace. To discuss this year's Media Prize and the impact of the Nobel Peace Prize in general, I'm joined by Henrik Urdal, the director of the Peace Research Institute Oslo, PRIO. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Henrik, it's lovely to see you. It's been a while. I'm so delighted that we could chat today. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Dan. This prize, the Nobel Peace Prize this year, it has been warmly welcomed. And uh, usually, you know, these prizes are very controversial. And I suppose one way of looking at it is the more controversial it is, the more attention it gets. But this prize seems to have received acceptance and has been praised all around. And what I find particularly interesting is that you, my friend, you every year publish a list of people that you think should win. And you have the organization Reporters Without Borders were on your list. So I'm just perhaps thinking uh, that you are extremely delighted. So give us your first thoughts on this prize. No, indeed, Dan. I'm I'm very delighted to see that we're finally getting a media or journalism prize, whatever you want to call it. We've had journalists and and media organizations on our list, as you say, the short list that we publish every year. We've had this on our list for five consecutive years, both organizations and individual journalists. And this is a prize that is speaking to so many important big issues of our time and the the whole narrative of fake news, the importance of freedom of information, freedom of expression for democracy, and of course, the direct role that journalists are playing in armed conflicts everywhere really speak to the importance of this prize as a, I think, a, a new domain in uh, in within the prize. There have been journalists in the past who have received the Nobel Peace Prize, but this is the first media prize in, in my view. So what do you think explains this lack of focus on journalists in the prize's history? Why is it that individual journalists, and there are many very brave journalists all over the world, why do you think there has been a reluctance? And I know you're just guessing, but maybe you have some inside information. I don't know. Why do you think journalists have not been prioritized to the extent that they should have been? So I, I do think that the committee has been uh, discussing this for, for quite some time. And uh, and in some ways, this is a this is an evergreen, right? It's uh, it's not necessarily something that that uh, needs to come in one particular year because this, the the kind of long term important contributions that we know matter, and then I think it is it is not a conventional way of thinking about the uh, the specifications in Alfred Nobel's will. So it it doesn't sort of specifically address these of these key principles in the will, but I think you can very easily interpret it. And then there have been there are some some historical prizes that that uh, speak to some of the same thing. You had uh, the the prize for Karl von Ossietzky back in in 1936, which uh, which was a prize for his work largely to reveal the um, the uh, armament of the uh, German state. So so that is uh, perhaps the closest you get. And then uh, you had a prize to Tavakul Karman in, in 2011. And she is also a journalist, but, but didn't receive the prize for journalism. But I, I think it's, um, it's p- perhaps been a reluctance on the part of the committee to uh, sort of see this as a contribution in its own right. But like many other domains, this is one that I think has 
has grown on the committee. And I think the, the decisive factor in most recent years has precisely been this huge discussion about how we regulate, uh, especially online platforms, and how we deal with the misinformation or the infodemic that uh, that many are talking about. And I, I think that has combined with, with all of these, uh, these other factors, and specifically the role of journalists in peace and conflict. I think these factors combined is what is now leading to a price for, for media and journalism. As you know, the prize, even though it is often considered, at least by us in Norway, and we love it when other media say this is the most prestigious prize in the world, it isn't always seen to be doing what it should be doing in terms of peace, right? So you had this very prestigious institution, Prio, that's doing excellent work in terms of peace research. So I'd like to hear your views on this. How do you think one makes that connection? Because, you know, the the will that Alfred Nobel has has a very minimalist formulation, and the committee has been criticized and praised of late for having perhaps expanded their understanding of what causes peace. Now, if you were to put on your peace researcher hat or the director of PRIO hat, Henrik, how would you say the committee has operationalized these prizes in terms of promotion of peace? Do you think that is a clear-cut connection or what are your thoughts there? That's a great question, Dan. And and I've I've been critical of many of the prizes in the past, precisely because they they lack a, a very strong and good rationale that we, you know, at, at least that that we from a research perspective can can agree are watertight. And I think it, it's quite interesting because the rationale provided in the announcement points to to some two two distinct areas, but also. The um, head of the committee, Birgit Reis Andersen, has expanded on some of these notions after in the extension of the uh, of the announcement. And I would like to point out both that the focus on 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 a media price as something that is underscoring the importance of freedom of information, freedom of expression for democracy is absolutely essential. This was something that Birgit Reis Andersen emphasized when she presented announced the price. And we know from research that democratic governance is associated with peace and stability. Uh, You have the democratic peace hypothesis, which empirically is well demonstrated that uh, the two democratic states never go to war against each other. And then there is a whole discussion about whether democracies are more peaceful inherently. And I think the the record is a, is a little bit more mixed when it comes to that. But uh, but clearly, democracy is associated with stability. And, and in a way, you can think of this prize speaking to democratic governance. And the second point is the way that journalists in conflict areas are providing information, often the most accurate and, and sometimes even the, the only uh, reliable information coming out of conflict areas. And this is something that conflict and peace researchers are using directly in the in our studies our empirical studies of uh, of armed conflict so i think this can be defended as a price that is both a, pr- a price for conflict prevention uh, more broadly but also one that that enable us to analyze and consider and uh, and possibly also use as a as a mean to to study how we may be able to intervene in uh, in conflicts in order to try to to mend them to stop them So, Henrik, this prize obviously has a clear-cut connection between the winning of the prize and the activities and peace promotion. What, in your view, and you mentioned this earlier, that you're often critical of some of the prizes. Can you name like some prizes you felt this has nothing to do with peace? I mean, I, I I would like to say that I think the committee in, in recent years have made good good selections, have found worthy candidates, and and have also been increasingly interested in trying to tie these up to uh, to the uh, the will one of of my issues have been with some of the prizes for uh, for environmental contributions i think you can possibly make the connection to alfred nobel's will and say that that coming together to solve environmental problems is is absolutely essential to uh, to his point about about fraternity between nations and uh, and if you leave it at that and say that you know the 
climate change is is undoubtedly the most one of the most pressing issues of our time and and uh, for human security for uh, you know nations to come together and, and try to solve that and and mend the consequence of climate change i i think is uh, is absolutely unproblematic what i do think is uh, is more of an issue is the way that the committee in the past both with the 2004 prize to Vangari matai and the 2007 prize to ipcc and al gore the way that they've linked climate change and environmental degradation straight up to uh, to uh, armed conflict that's both empirically not entirely correct uh, because the evidence is is mixed and i think especially when we are so dependent on science underpinning the whole discussion about climate change and and the way we deal with it it's haphazard at best to uh, to be uh, not to be uh, setting the same standards for the way that we argue about any link between climate change and security but the other thing is that these these notions also about, about climate change and conflict also involve some stereotypes that i don't think uh, are entirely true when it comes to, for instance, migration and the uh, potential security implications of migration that I think we need to at least address and uh, and be willing to discuss. So so those are, you know, some of the prizes, at least that I think the the committee in the past has has not not always managed to uh, to uh, argue our our sort of obvious strong cases. Yeah, I was thinking about Vangari Matai. You know, that was the first time in recent memory i can think of where people were questioning you know what is this peace promotion and and as you know in the norwegian media but also internationally there's always somebody questioning the linkage and another prize i remember distinctly where people were questioning was mohammed yunus Grameen Bank and microfinance. In my view, it's a bit like the sustainable development discourse or SDGs. Whatever is popular, you can prove it. You know, you could always make a case that whatever you're doing is promoting sustainable development. I wanted to ask you, you know, something that a lot of our activist students are very interested in. There's so much attention on Greta Thunberg and her compatriots all over the world. So in your view, giving the prize to somebody like Greta would not be in tune with the will? Have I understood you correctly? Yeah, exactly. And I'm, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of Greta Thunberg and the work that she's doing. But if you want to point to sort of a contribution that I think speaks to Alfred Nobel's will, I would rather than select a candidate like the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the structure that is organizing the, um, the COP negotiations. So from my perspective, that would be a, a better price under Alfred Nobel. And then we can, you know, as you say, Dan, discuss where are the exact boundaries between, you know, any good cause that uh, that contributes to uh, to sort of human development more broadly and, and how well that relates to the will. Uh, I think in many ways that if, you, if you're if you expanding the notion of uh, of peace too much, then uh, then pretty much anything can fit under the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. And I I don't necessarily think that the price nor necessarily their causes are are well served by by not at all addressing exactly where you know what, what the what the reasonable domains of the price should be. I think one of the challenges and I'd like to hear a view on this is that you know you have so many people you and I can propose candidates, right? Politicians can propose candidates. And so you may end up with 300, 350 suggestions. And one challenge is to sort of maintain the boundaries between who we think is deserving because some some issue is a burning topic. You know, we want to prioritize that. So you have the, the everyday politics aspect. And then there is the nitty gritties of making the link to promotion of peace, which maybe academics or others are better suited. And and so what I'm trying to get at here is there has been criticism, of course, that the prize is political, that, you know, with President Obama getting it, you know, without doing much, you're giving it. The intention seems to be more important sometimes than the result. So it can't be easy for the committee to separate what is really fashionable, people are concerned with today, from making this somewhat academic, 
connection to a very narrow definition of promoting peace. I mean, you know, is that too much for for us to expect the committee members to deal with it? You know, it surely must be a big challenge. Oh, indeed. And I, I, I would like to say, though, that, of course, the Peace Prize, and like the science prizes, uh, science Nobel prizes, you know, the Peace Prize is inherently political. So, so the decision by the committee will, of course, be, be flavored also about what, what the sense of the uh, sort of politically most urgent issues are, whether those are, you know, more in the conventional domains or, or uh, you know, in, in this case where we're at least talking about the, uh, the expansion of the domain of the price. It is important for the price and for the committee to be addressing sort of current issues that are of significant uh, importance and, and other other candidates that have been discussed this year are Belarus opposition groups. You had her on uh, your list, right? She, she was uh, she was in my view the uh, the, the main runner up to uh, to a journalism prize. So Svetlana Tikhanushkaya, I think, would would have been an excellent uh, candidate. But we also have human rights defenders, pro democracy activists in other countries and other areas like Hong Kong and Xinjiang. We've discussed other journalists in countries like Turkey. So. Any such price, I think, would uh, would necessarily connect to uh, to uh, to current affairs, and then the committee will have to balance the. Uh, you, you brought up the issue about you know aspirations versus you know achievements, and and that's uh, that's something that the committee is is trying to uh, to balance in a good way. Of course, if you're only going to give the price to things that have achieved and are secured and are, you know, a thing of the past, the, the, the price could potentially get a little toothless. On the other hand, if you're if you're giving it merely for for aspirations and, and ambitions and not for any achievements at all, you could of course risk giving it too early. And there are a number of, of you know cases like that in the past of good both both excellent you know examples of the committee succeeding. And I think uh, the prize in 2016 to Santos in Colombia was one such case where likely the the price contributed to pushing the peace agreement over the uh, the finishing line, but of course, then you have the price to uh, to Abiy Ahmed in 2019, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, and even though that prize was given specifically for the peace agreement with Eritrea, the the rationale in reality was broader, because the expectations were that that his aspirations to creating development, creating stability in the whole of uh, of the whole region of Eastern Africa would have been you know a huge achievement and then giving it to a state leader there's always a chance that uh, the things are going to fall apart and that was indeed what happened in Ethiopia and it's difficult to say today that that price has been successful so so there is uh, there is this uh, this balancing act that the committee is trying to uh, to to strike you know in hindsight it's always easy to criticize and i was a big fan of the prize to abi ahmed i have to say i was in the room the day he received it and we I was part of a, a seminar that you guys organized at Prio. We were discussing this. It seemed that even the critics who, in hindsight, say that the prize should not have been given, admit that at that time, everything was perfect. So, you know, I have a lot of sympathy also for the Nobel Committee. You know, things can go wrong very fast. And at that time, Abi did wonderful things. And everybody, there was this hope, this optimism. Even his speech was full of brotherhood and medemid, you know, how we should be reaching out and being your sister's keeper, your brother's keeper. So I still am a very big fan of rewarding people for peace agreements and helping them get the kind of support within their countries so that these peace agreements that were reached don't break up again. But Henrik, the extent to which the prize is often viewed by certain regimes around the world as being political, this is something that we've seen in terms of where our relationship, Norway-China relationship, etc. in the past, and, and maybe also we'll see in the future, there is always this tendency for the Nobel Prize Committee to say, we are not political. We're independent and we have nothing to do with the Norwegian government. You and I can understand that, but surely you can also see that from a, an outsider's perspective, given that you have active politicians nominating, as has been the case this year with Maria Ressa being nominated by our prime minister, you must, I'm sure, sympathize with those who question 
these neat categories of political independence or political dependence. What are your thoughts there? I, th- I think it is it is important to underscore that sort of formally there is there is an independence between the committee and Norwegian foreign policy. And I think uh, you know the 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 prize Ilu Chabot. 2010 was was uh, was an example of of a prize that wasn't sort of in the in the interest of Norwegian Norwegian government. In the same way, you know, the prize to ICANN in in, uh, in 2017 was was indirectly also sort of a criticism of uh, of Norwegian and and other uh, NATO allies' reliance on on nuclear weapons. So I I think I think the committee has proven over the years that they're also willing to take to make choices that are unpopular with the with Norwegian government that being said i think there is you know what what you're asking also has the sort of a broader implication that of course the issues that the nobel committee is uh, is interested in are in many ways uh, sort of the the conventional western northern perspectives on what are good causes of uh, for peace and even though they've been better at making sure that they're seeing contributions sort of globally and especially in the in the global south it it very much is a price for for, for western values if you like to put it uh, sort of in a in, in a in a slightly more you know narrow narrow language and i think you know it, it is a price that has its historical roots and, and in many ways you you uh, you know you have to accept it for what it is and and uh, I still think it is important for the committee to reflect on that issue and I think you know one one issue that is is coming up regularly is, is whether or not the committee in principle could could award a prize for instance to Julian Assange and that's uh, I think is uh, is a much more uncomfortable question to ask because I think that would uh, that would be much less likely and I think there are you know good reasons especially in a year where we when we get a prize to uh, to journalists who are working in uh, in areas with uh, with violence and, and conflict, that you know the the fact that we're, that we're persecuting a publicist slash journalist who is revealing secrets about U.S. and, and allied you know, significant war atrocities is uh, is something that that I think is quite problematic the, with the way that uh, that uh, you know there is a, a political a lack of political will or yeah, a lack of political will to to do something uh, like that. So let's round off our conversation, Henrik, with uh, the current prize. And I know that at Prio, your institute, there's been considerable research on liberation technology, just as some of my colleagues at Stanford have been writing about it, like my friend Larry Diamond, that you have all these media channels that are in many ways, making information more democratic, more accessible. And yet you also have the same technology being used for repression. So you could have liberation technology on the one hand and repression technology on the other hand. And that is why I think this current prize is particularly relevant. And I've watched Maria Ressa over the years. I remember her when I was a student and she was a correspondent for CNN. She was a, an investigative journalist there, an anchor. And I've seen some of these videos, these viral videos of her interviewing Rodrigo Duterte, this guy who was seen to be charismatic, free thinking and free speaking guy who on air threatens Maria Ressa. And then we have Dmitry Muratov and his organization where you have journalists, his colleagues have been killed. And yet, paradoxically, one would think that the Kremlin would, of course, be critical, but the spokesperson of President Putin actually congratulated him. And that led to people saying, hey, maybe these guys are not that critical after all. So if we could conclude our conversation, Henrik, with some thoughts you have on this relationship between technology as a liberation technology and repression technology, and how you see this prize helping the promotion of human rights, strengthening democracies, and helping journalists perhaps feel that they have much more support out there to undertake this kind of brave 
investigative reporting that very many are doing, not just in Russia or in the Philippines, but in very many parts of the world. Absolutely, and and to start off with with what you what you ended on, uh, Dan, I think. The, it is quite clear from the way that uh, that this prize has been formulated that this is a prize not only to do t- these two extraordinary individuals uh, who have been working in, in in extremely difficult contexts, but to journalists who are doing similar work elsewhere in the world. So this is this is a prize that points to an ideal that they're working towards that uh, that is considered to be absolutely essential for for democratic governance and then i think there is an interesting tension in the way that this prize has been formulated because on one hand the committee is underscoring the the absolutely essential contribution or or significance of freedom of uh, speech freedom of expression at the same time as one of the the key focus areas of for instance maria ressa has precisely been how social media can can spiral out of control how social media is contributing to creating polarization and how political forces are using and misusing these platforms for their own benefit and we see this already in terms of the facebook issue now exactly exactly so so i think that's that's an extremely interesting tension because we've re, re, we've reached a, as you say you know we've had we have this situation where uh, social media is also a liberating technology i mean we saw that under during the uh, the the arab spring we've seen that in other contexts you know in turkey where uh, where student protesters have been using twitter they've been using facebook they've been using other other social media channels to both organize and to share information that's uh, critical to uh, to developing strategies so this is uh, th- this is both a tool that uh, that has enormous possibilities for overcoming collective action problems at the same time as governments are now you know upping their efforts so they're able to uh, to counter many of these uh, these ways that activists have been using this technology and uh, you know we have we're having this this discourse about the lack of self-regulation of the platforms and the lack of sort of responsible action taking on the part taking on the part of Facebook and, and Twitter and others for making sure that they're contributing to creating this enlightened public discourse rather than creating and and um, supporting this uh, sort of more diverting and polarizing uh, discourses. You know, one of the things I really do miss I love social media. You know, you and I are on Twitter, we use Facebook, etc. But the risk in recent years has been that we end up in these echo chambers, mm-hmm. that we end up talking with people we like and we share similar views. And what has worried me as very many people is that we really need mainstream media, the moderating voice to come in. We need editors somehow filtering out this noise and 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 that is what actually separates the really good media platforms that is why i still read the financial times or the new york times or the guardian or often Boston from tabloid newspapers, right? So some media are being sucked into the sensationalism, getting the, the, the you know, getting clicks uh, rather than the content. So I think what this prize, in my view, does is it makes a case for this mainstream media, the moderating voice of mainstream media, some sort of a quality stamp on what is published so prioritizing quality rather than quantity, which for me is what social media is. No, absolutely. And, and, and you're pointing to the two, the two key areas. It's both the moderating factor. I mean, those, the, the, the editorial touch on, uh, and, and contributions to, uh, to managing this stream of information and the quality content. And both, I think, are absolutely fundamental challenges with the ways that, that Facebook and other online platforms are working currently. My, my only small reservation with, with, uh, with this year's prize is that that sort of overall ambition to, uh, to try to find ways to both regulate and, and encourage the 
platforms to self-regulate is disappearing a little bit when when the focus is on two journalists. So, and that's also why we pointed to uh, Reporters Without Borders as one way of precisely pointing to these different domains in a in a much more stronger and, and structured way. And and the uh, with with the committee potentially giving the prize to three individuals or combination of individuals and and organizations. You know, my ideal prize would have been these two winners and the Reporters Without Borders RSF. So, so Maria, she's a member of Reporters. She's both right? a member of uh, of RSF, but she's also been contributing substantially to to their campaign on the, the initiative on on information and democracy, which actually Prio has also been a founding member of. So, so this I think is a a very important and sort of crucial initiative that is focusing on what I think is the key issues because we can't we can't turn the clock back we can't uh, go back to the paper newspapers and uh, and and assume that uh, you know we, we can roll things back to the way they were but we need to find good ways to to really you know start governing these platforms that are here to stay Henrik it's always fun to see you and chat with you thank you so much for coming on my show today thank you so much for having me Dan If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.